this weekend we're launching a new message series that we're calling Dangerous Prayer. Well, that title may sound like an oxymoron, rather like an accurate estimate, a definite maybe, a minor crisis, an objective opinion, a working bureaucracy. If I were to point someone out to you and said, they're dangerous, and you asked, why? And I responded, because they pray. You would think that a strange answer, wouldn't you? Your grandma prays. Your Sunday school teacher prays. Dangerous people don't pray. Tony Soprano does not pray. (laughs) Dangerous in prayers are not words that we tend to put together, much less praying dangerous prayers. But through the course of this series, we're going to be discussing both. What's the difference? What's the difference between a dangerous prayer and, say, a safe prayer? Well, safe prayers are softer, gentler prayers. They're vague. They're general kinds of prayers. The spiritual equivalent of pleasant small talk, grace before meals, a child's prayer at bedtime, the blessing at the end of Mass today. A significant example for Catholics would be devotions. In the Catholic tradition, devotions are popular prayers and pious practices used to worship God or venerate Mary and the saints. Often devotions express a particular conviction about the object of the devotion. Eucharistic adoration is an expression of Catholic belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Devotions to Mary, like the Rosary, which we celebrate all this month, or the saints, commonly express confidence in their role as spiritual companions and guides. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not in the least criticizing or downplaying the importance of daily devotional prayer. It's a critical and necessary part of many of our relationships with God. It's fundamental to spiritual life and growth. Heck, Tom and I write and publish devotionals all the time. We've got one coming out this Christmas that we'll be handing out to you. So obviously, I am an advocate and fan of devotions. Devotions can be wonderful prayers that are comforting and consoling and encouraging, that express and strengthen our faith. Dangerous prayers are different. Dangerous prayers make specific requests to God. When we pray dangerous prayers, we're very clear about what we're asking for. Dangerous prayers require us to stretch our faith and trust in God. They take us to places in our relationship with God that we've never been before. Dangerous prayers rely on God's power and presence and expect a response. Dangerous prayers mean you're all in. They're cries from the heart that connect with the the deepest desires of our heart. Dangerous prayers search your soul. They break your habits. They change your path and set you on the direction of the more that God has in store. They remove mountains, work wonders, expect miracles kind of prayers. Now, before going any further, let's just deal with an issue that's always front and center whenever this topic is discussed. Let's call out something obvious about prayer that can be a huge obstacle to praying dangerous prayers. It's an obstacle that keeps many people in the shallow end of the prayer pull. And it's simply this. Some prayers work and some don't. That's a fact. That's a fact that can catch us off guard and trip us up, but facts can be our friends and it really shouldn't surprise us. Think about it. Some schools educate kids and some don't. Some businesses make money, and some don't. Some churches bring people closer to God, and some don't. So the fact that some don't doesn't in the least negate the fact that others do. In the same way, prayers that don't work, by which I 
guess we mean that don't seem to affect their desired outcomes, do not negate the prayers that do. And let me, let me admit that I have sometimes myself had this attitude, discounting all prayer on the basis of unanswered prayer. And let me also say, that's a pretty lazy response, and one that I would never take toward anything else that I cared about. In any area of life where I eventually found success, I didn't just accept initial failure, I learned from those failures. I figured out what wasn't working. Same for all of us when it comes to practically anything and everything. If you're a good golfer, you figured out why the ball was hooking left or right and you adjusted your swing. If you're an accomplished cook, you've learned which ingredients go together and which do not. If you've been successful in your marriage, you've come to know when to address problems and speak up and when to shut up. Our book, Rebuilt, is all about recognizing what wasn't working here at the parish and learning how to do church differently through our failures. So when specific prayer petitions don't appear to be answered as we want, when we want, it doesn't mean prayer doesn't work. Actually, as a general rule, when prayers don't seem effective or achieve their desired end, there are two major reasons why. First one could be that we're praying for something outside of God's will. If we pray for something that is harmful or not helpful, not something God wants to do, or even something that stands in opposition to his will, his grace and mercy won't let it happen. God just gives us a firm no. But it could also be that we're praying for something outside of God's timing. Sometimes it's just a question of timing. There can be so many reasons why we're not in God's timing, like the fact that we currently live in a fallen world that will be renewed and restored one day, but today is not that day. And that means that forces of darkness can actually currently work against our prayer. But more often, it's us. We're out of God's timing because we need to grow. We need to grow into the blessing that he eventually wants to give us. Our character needs to grow so that we can recognize and handle the blessing. So sometimes prayer seems not to work, and that discourages us, but sometimes it actually doesn't discourage us, and that's another obstacle to dangerous prayer. Sometimes, if we're entirely honest, we would rather that our prayers didn't matter all that much. It kind of lets me off the hook. I don't have to take prayer seriously or really even think about it at all. I don't have to get involved. But that's not the reality we stand before. The reality we stand before is that God takes us seriously. And so, he takes our prayers seriously, too. And he wants to challenge us and change us in our prayer. In the same way that parents teach their kids to handle money or clean their bedroom or do their homework so that they can learn the importance of responsibility and accountability. God wants us, wants to challenge and change us in our prayer. He wants us to see the influence and impact that we can have through the power of prayer. He wants us to see prayer as a powerful way in which we partner with him to bring his healing and wholeness, his goodness and grace to the world. It was St. Augustine who said, without God, we cannot. Without us, he will not. Prayer is powerful and we see it so clearly in scripture. We see it in an almost humorous way in the passage we've read this morning from Mark's gospel. We're in the 10th chapter of Mark where we read, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, 
came to Jesus and said to him, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. So James and John, two of Jesus' inner circle of followers, have, as we'll see, two prayer requests. And the first one is this one. Please do whatever we ask you to do. Now, there are no stupid prayers, but if there were, this would qualify as one. Spirituality 101 is this. There is a God, and it's not you. God is God, and you were created. When we ask God to do whatever we want, we're reversing that order. We're putting ourselves above God. Rather than praying to God, thy will be done, we're praying, my will be done. Powerful and effective prayer takes place inside God's will. In fact, one of the main objectives of prayer is to align our will with God's will. So James and John attempt to put themselves above Jesus. It's a very immature attitude. It's also a selfish one too. And as we can see later in the passage, their requests created resentment and conflict among the other 10 apostles. But Jesus isn't angry or annoyed. He doesn't chastise them or correct them. All of us pray prayers that can be simplistic and selfish. We can be immature in our prayer. And you know what? That's okay. Your kids can be immature sometimes, right? You still want them talking to you. There's just no wrong way to approach God in prayer. So Jesus responds to them patiently, gently. What do you wish me? What do you wish me to do for you? He invites them to offer their second prayer petition. In other words, to continue their prayer. That's another objective of prayer to enter into conversation with God and then to keep the conversation going. And so that's what happens. They answered him, grant that in your glory, we may sit one at your right and the other at your left. What are they talking about? Well, the two brothers are seeking to secure for themselves the top post in the Messiah's imagined future government. The apostles believed that Jesus was going to defeat the Romans and rule as king of Israel. And they want to be people of major influence in that kingdom. They didn't understand that Jesus didn't come to defeat the Romans. He came to defeat sin and death. He didn't come to reign from a throne. He came to reign from the cross. And so, again, with great patience, he says to them, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink? The cup is a metaphor in Scripture for what God has in store for someone, God's plan for someone. Sometimes the cup means a plan of blessing, a cup of blessing. But other times it portends suffering, suffering that's going to proceed the blessing. Jesus knows well that he's going to have to suffer in order to bring blessing to the world. And if they're going to follow him, same for them. So he tries to impress upon them that what they're praying for is a dangerous prayer. Do they understand that? Can they understand that? And they respond positively that they do, they can. Of course, they don't, not yet. So Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you will drink. They prayed a dangerous prayer, and their prayer was answered. And we know from history that both suffered greatly as followers of Jesus. John essentially died in exile and in prison. James died a martyr's death. But both stand as pillars of the faith with outside, outsized influence beyond anything they could have ever imagined or prayed for. Hebrew, Hebrews 10.31 says this, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing. It's a risky thing. It's a dangerous thing to know. We're not just praying to the man upstairs, but that God takes our prayers seriously, that our prayers matter. 
I believe that we as a church are on the edge of a breakthrough, a revival of sorts. But the breakthrough, that revival, will require more dangerous prayer, a deeper level of prayer that will be new to some people, and for many others, we need to return to it. Revival is a time in which people's hearts are being awakened to God. Revival is a time in which people see how great is our God. A revival in which there are miracles taking place, reveal miracles we see with our own eyes. God wants to bring revival to his church, but it comes through dangerous prayers. And the people that will see this revival are the people that will know personally in their own hearts who will pray dangerous prayers and will know God has moved in their lives because revival begins in our own hearts and our own lives and our own dangerous prayers. So our encouragement, our challenge for this series is for you to pick at least one, you can pray more, but at least one dangerous prayer in which you know it'll be God's hand that's moving. It's a move mountain type of prayer that without God's grace, without God moving, it could not possibly happen. Maybe your dangerous prayer, it's a prayer of healing. You need healing in your, in your body. You are, are suffering from a disease or some kind of, of, of infirmity and you need God to come and heal your body. Maybe you need God to heal you or someone you love, a family member, heal them physically or spiritually or emotionally. Maybe the healing you're looking for is reconciliation in your marriage or among your larger family. The wounds are so, so, so deep that without a movement of God's grace, it is impossible for there to be any forgiveness or reconciliation. Maybe your dangerous prayer is a prayer of impact. You want your life to matter. You want to see the purpose and deeper meaning of your life and how you can positively impact others or, or help people in need. And so that will be your dangerous prayer. Prayer. Maybe for you, it's a prayer of provision. You're in deep, deep debt and you need to get out of it. Without God's grace, you don't know how you're gonna get out of that hole. Or there's some resources you need for your family or in your business or your organization and you haven't figured out how to find those resources and you see your dangerous prayers, God, please provide the people I need or the ideas I need or whatever resources. Maybe your dangerous prayer is something I haven't mentioned, it's, but it's an impossible situation. Whatever it is, here's the commitment we encourage you to make. You're gonna keep on praying and keep on praying and keep on praying until you see God move in some way. And you're gonna say to God, God, I am standing on your promises. God, you promised that if we will pray and we will ask in your name and we will stand in your will and in your promises that God, you will come through. So God, I am not gonna stop praying until I see you move. My encouragement to you this week would be set aside some time, actually maybe right to this afternoon or early tomorrow morning when you get down on your knees for 15, 20 minutes and you cry out to God your dangerous prayer. So to prepare for that, we're gonna take a moment now to invite the Holy Spirit upon us to give us the wisdom, the courage to pray a bold and risky prayer. So whether you're joining us here on Ridgely Road or online, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to kneel and we're gonna give a moment for the Holy Spirit to come upon us, to listen to the Holy Spirit for what that prayer is. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to enlighten our minds, soften our hearts to the dangerous prayer that we're to pray. And now we just give you this moment of quiet and silence to fill our minds and our hearts.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a good, good Father, that you invite us to grow up and to mature in our prayer as your sons and daughters. So God, we do pray that through the course of this series, we would grow up, we would mature to see that our prayers really do matter. And God, we would see your hand move in a powerful way, that we would see you move mountains in a way that's unmistakable, unmistakable to each and every one of us. And Father, we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen.